Good evening, if we could take our seats, please. All right, good evening. I'm going to call this meeting to order. Dr. Foley, roll call, please. President Kaler, members of the board, please let the record show that all members are present. Thank you very much. We're going to have a moment of silence followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. on here to 2.1. I move that we approve the agenda. Second. Questions or concerns? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries 5-0. Dr. Foley, superintendent's report, please. President Taylor, members of the board, obviously we've just returned from fall break, and as I pull up here, we have our upcoming events with a, a superintendent visit to Cortina in the near future, where we can check out the lovely painting that has been occurring on the campus. We also have meetings the month of November um, and another superintendent visit, so we're excited to be able to showcase some great things happening in our schools. We also want to thank Chartwells this evening for their lovely partnership. We had an opportunity tonight to uh, try some of their healthy examples of their discovery kitchen and try a few of the mood boost things that are coming to our cafeterias in the near future. Uh, and that concludes the superintendent's report. Thank you, Dr. Foley. Yes, I hope everybody got a snack tonight because there was um, quite a few goodies there to try. So again, thank you to Chartwells and Sam and everybody out there. Any board comments? Mrs. Wilson. I had a great fall break. I hope everyone else did too, because it was just fabulous with a nice two weeks off. And it, I've heard lots of great reports from where everybody went. And even those who didn't go someplace got to enjoy the nice weather here. So thanks for, thank you to Higley for continuing our two weeks. Thank you. Anything else? Okay, moving on. <coughs> Any request to speak, Mrs. Zimmerman? No request to speak. Moving on. I move that we approve consent agenda items 6.1 to 6.11. Second. Questions or concerns? Do you want to point out um, several gifts? Uh, girls Volleyball and the Higley High School Parents United Booster Club all gave... Um, large donations for their Utah trip that's coming up this weekend, I believe. We have Aaron Johnson who donated some items for the Sossaman Early Childhood Development Center. The American Heart Association, I love this, money where most needed, um, with $2,500 going to Power Ranch. Also the um, high school theater boosters raised money, $13,000 over for their Thescon um, event that's gonna be coming up. So. Thank you for all those gifts and donations. It truly helps our public schools in every way. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries, 5-0. 
Moving right along, we are going to have a career and technical education update tonight. Dr. Foley. President Kaler, members of the board, we are very proud tonight to have a presentation for you about a CTE program update and to hear from some of our amazing student leaders and our instructors. And I'm going to invite Mr. Craig Pearson to the podium so that he can begin this presentation this evening. I am proud and honored to be here tonight to be able to give you an update on our CTE programs and the successes that they're having. Uh, so let's go ahead and jump right into that. Um, uh, if we can get the clicker to work. There we go. Mm. There we go. All right, uh, for the 22-23 school year, uh, we, are, we currently are offering 20 programs at the two high schools. We have 11 programs at Williamsfield High School and nine programs currently at Higley High School. Um, you see there we have a new program at both high schools this year, which is the Technical Theater Program, uh, which was a natural progression of our drama program and it developing over the last couple of years. Uh, we're excited to be able to offer some support to that program and uh, have a dedicated technical theater teacher now at both, both campuses. Um, enrollment, 22-23 uh, enrollment uh, at the 40th day, which is one of our counting periods, is, was at 2,572 students in CTE. Uh, this is uh, continuing to show a growth pattern in our district of our CTE programs over the last five years. Uh, our growth has been 48%. Uh, so as we continue to add programs and those programs continue to grow and be successful, um, we continue to attract students to these programs. So we're excited about that. Um, one of the things that I am very excited about is the fact that uh, we currently are now offering and paying for certifications in every single one of our CTE programs. And you can see in many of these programs, we are paying for multiple certifications for our students. Um, some of the highlight uh, certifications on here, the base certification, which is the biotechnician uh, assistant certification exam, is a certification offered through the University of Florida. Uh, that's for our biotechnology program students. Um, criminal justice is offering multiple certifications through uh, crime scene management, uh, sec security. They offer a lot of the FEMA certifications to their students as well. Um, our early childhood program, which we'll, we'll talk about a little bit later on as well, is offering the mandated reporter, the first aid CPR. Their second year students can take the Praxis Parapro. And then our third year students, and this is our first year for that, uh, that course, are being prepared to take the uh, Child Development Associate Certification, which will make them very marketable when they get out of high school. So we're excited about the different opportunities we have for all of our programs and the certifications that we're able to offer for our students. Um, along with certifications, we have a plethora of dual enrollment opportunities for our students through CTE. Um, so I have two slides here. This first slide is showing the different dual enrollment that is offered at Williamsfield High School by program. Uh, the second slide shows you the uh, certification or the dual enrollment opportunities at Higley High School uh, and their programs. And just this week, the criminal justice program at both high schools was offered the uh, uh, certification from Chandler Gilbert Community College if the students complete the courses. Uh, so both programs will be offering 15 credits that lead to a certification from Chandler Gilbert, um, which is absolutely amazing. So those kids can leave with 10 to 12 academic credits. They can leave with 15 credits in criminal justice, be halfway their way to an associate degree before they leave high school. Um, and there's, again, opportunities in almost every program for dual enrollment right now. Um, so this is a little bit of an eye chart, and I'm going to spend a, a, few, a few minutes kind of going through this one. The state of Arizona CTE department um, creates performance measures that are 
used for all school districts throughout the state, and we are measured against the, the cut scores or those measurements every year. Uh, for this 2022 school year, uh, Higley High School once again was above the, not, not only above the, the required 90%, but above the 100% level in every category. So this is the third year that we've, we've met all of those in a row. Um, the first four are graduation rate, math, reading, and science scores. These are primarily academic, but you can see here that a Higley student that completes two years of a program uh, has a graduation rate of 96.7%. So students that are in CTE finish and graduate high school at a higher rate than the state average, at a higher rate um, than the general population, as well as here, we're 4% above the state average of CTE students that complete programs. So uh, our students are amazing, our teachers are amazing, and they help these students find value in being at high school and completing high school. So uh, the reading, math, and science scores are based off our AZ Science and um, our ACT and ACT Aspire tests. So these are academic indicators. You can see here where the state's cut score on these is, is tremendously low compared to our local performance. So um, in language arts or reading language, you can see that uh, our proficiency score is at 67% proficient. The state's cut score is 24%. Um, in math, we're 74% proficient. The state's cut score is 28. And in science, we're at 71% proficient and the state's cut score is at 20%. So we far exceed the state's average on all of these areas. Um, the last four are CTE specific. So um, placement is a measurement of what our students are doing and what they're achieving six months after they graduate high school. Um, we track our students and our teachers track them down, find out whether or not they're in college, whether they're working in the military, doing a service, uh, service uh, project like um, Serve America or Peace Corps um, or on a religious mission. 79.6% um, of Higley students are placed either in a career field that they got training for in their CTE program, in a college program that's related to their CTE program, or serving our community in some other way. Um, the state's average is 76.5%, so we're above that. Um, and that's a difficult one because we have to try to track down students six months after they graduate. Sometimes it's hard to track down students when they're here. So. <laughs> Um, the next, uh, non-traditional, um, the state has specific programs where they focus on trying to drive and build non-traditional participation. Uh, for example, having males in a medical, medical professions or having females in a welding or an industrial type of program. And so uh, for Perkins and federal grant reasons, we have to track our non-traditional um, performance. You can see here that we are at 36.5% of, uh, of our programs that have non-traditional um, classifications, 36.5% of our students are non-traditional. Um, we are one of very few districts in the state that meet this requirement. Um, many districts have struggled with this one um, mightily, and the state average I, is at 33.5%, but I've seen those numbers as low as 10, 15% for school districts. So uh, we're very fortunate to have programs that attract students that are uh, and not based on their gender, and teachers that make students feel welcome. Uh, the next, uh, industry-recognized credentials. Higley's performance is that 82.8% of our seniors last year were, who completed a program had an industry certification. The state's average was 33%. Um, to me, that's the number one thing that I emphasize to our teachers is important to our, to our programs. If we want to have quality programs and we want to show that our programs are meeting industry needs, having the students graduate with that certification in hand is the measurement that we are measured by. So um, four years ago when I came back to Higley, it became my, my focus to make sure that all of our programs had the opportunity to have kids take those. Um, I wanna say that we were probably offering a certification in two or three programs when I returned, 
Now we're offering it in every program, and you can see that these numbers have grown uh, over the year. And the last is the technical skills assessment. That's the uh, state test that the uh, students take at the end of the year for their individualized programs. Um, our pass rate on that was a 75.3% for this cohort, and um, the state average is 70.5%, so again, above on all those performance indicators. So uh, these show that our teachers are very strong in what they're teaching. They're very connected to their curriculum. They have delivery and, and uh, practices that allow our students to understand and, and grasp the concepts. And uh, I could not be more proud of our teachers and our administrators that are running these programs. Next year is our official state monitoring. So each time that the state comes up with a new state plan, which is about every five to six years uh, to meet federal compliance guidelines, they come up with a new plan for how they're going to monitor CTE programs. Um, in previous years, they would monitor two to three programs a year over the five-year period, and so you knew this year was graphic design, film and TV, and digital photography, and next year was gonna be engineering and something else. In their wisdom, they decided that this time they would go by CTED. So next year, all of our programs will be monitored at the same time. So knowing that, we have been working as a department to um, update all of our materials over the last two to three years, try to keep compliant, find out what it is the state's looking for through the other districts that are, have been going through this monitoring, and we put together a plan to make sure that our teachers are prepared and not overwhelmed. So uh, this year is really a, a year where we're just collecting documents and putting them in folders that we've been working on over the last year or two. So it's not a tremendous reach, but it is additional work for our teachers and we've been cognizant of that. So we've made sure that we've built in extra time for them to be able to work on these things on half days, um, as well as build supports in place so that, that they can be supported in being able to meet all of the requirements that they need to for the state. Uh, we'll be notified next month officially. We will go through training officially in February, and at the end of May, they will open up a portal for us to start uploading documents, and then the CTE departments will start reviewing those documents, communicating back and forth on things, and then next school year, they will actually come out and do site visits, walk through the programs, talk with the teachers, um, verify that equipment and inventory that we say we purchased with grant money is actually here and where it should be. So we'll have all of those things in place. So, but on to the fun stuff. So high, program highlights at Higley High School. The largest program that we have in the district in CTE is criminal justice. It is a program that we started four years ago. Um, it had 30 students. Um, at Higley High School and I think 25 students at Williamsfield High School and it went to 120 students to 300 students to now the district has over 500 students. One in every five CTE students is in criminal justice. Um, this program has exploded. Uh, there was no way to foresee that this would be the popular program for our students, um, but they are getting a lot of inf great information and they are loving this program. Um, part of that might be it's a little edgy. Um, we tend to focus a little bit on uh, you know, current events and we, we have to teach them current, tacti current, current tactics and, and training. And so kids, uh, kids, kids kind of like that. It's kind of like going to a, an amusement park. Um, but uh, they're getting a great education and uh, even though we only have about 35 to 40 percent of our students complete this program, what I like to say and I tell our, our teachers all the time is that we're going to have a tremendous group of students that are educated citizens about the way law enforcement and the criminal justice system works. And to me, that is probably the most important thing that we can do. Um, so when they see a news re newsreel and they see a 10 second clip of video, they understand that there was a lot more video taken and somebody cherry picked that 10 seconds for a specific reason. Um, one of the activities they do in that program that I really love is our teachers will show a video, ask students, was the officer acting appropriately or inappropriately? And then they will reenact the scenario in the classroom 
And almost inevitably, all the people who thought it was inappropriate behavior, once they go through the processes, end up changing their minds and saying, no, the police did what they had to do. So I just, it's, it's exciting to watch that program. Um, our early childhood education program added their third year. Like I said before, they, we were, they're gonna be sitting for the CDA exam this year, which is a, a tremendous credential for those students to have. Um, and that program partners with our early childhood learning centers. Um, and so our second and third year students are over there multiple times throughout the week, actually training in the classroom with the teachers, getting that, exper that firsthand experience. Um, after the first year, our students can also apply for, and they do apply for, uh, positions in Kids Club. And so they're working with our Kids Club after school programs, uh, lo logging all of those hours they need for, need for that uh, certification. But um, being able to immerse them in an actual preschool versus creating a, a pseudo preschool environment at our schools has been a tremendous uh, value to those students. And I've got to tell you that Ms. Patty and Ms. Stacy absolutely love them too. So, um, engineering at Higley High School had two teams go to the VEX World Competition last year in Dallas, Texas. Both teams placed in the top 25% of the world. Um, and both teams returned as the seniors this year. So we are looking forward to seeing what those two teams are gonna do this year. Uh, one of the students actually went and bought himself a co competition set and set it up in his garage over the summer, built, built, started building his robots, and he has got his, he's got a head start ready to go. He's actually leading the program at Higley High School and mentoring all of the kids at Sossman. So he, just amazing work being done there. Um, graphic design at Higley High School has one national officer, who you'll get to hear from here in just a few minutes, one state officer, four regional officers, and two CTE presidential scholar applicants. Um, a few years ago, you may remember that Higley High School had a presidential uh, scholar that was chosen from state of Arizona to represent Arizona at the national level. I bet we have at least one, if not two, that will be doing that again this year. So, and you'll get a chance to meet them in just a little bit. And then we added the technical theater program at Higley High School this year as well. Over to Williams Field. Our biotechnology program has, um, conjured up a partnership with Bridgestone Tires. Uh, if you're NASCAR fans, about a month ago, you saw a NASCAR race where all the tires were green. It's because they were all made from a plant called a Gaiacal plant. And that plant, uh, the, is, they use the extracts from that plant to create rubber compounds for those tires. Bridgestone has a facility, two facilities here in the local area, and our program is working with them to uh, grow those plants. And, extract, and learn how to extract the rubber compounds out of that. So our students are doing the same work that they're doing at those facilities. Uh, and Bridgestone is helping to partner with that and helping fund that a little bit as well. Um, our criminal justice program at Williamsfield is partnering with the Maricopa County Juvenile Courts uh, to host a teen court program. This is a, a, a juvenile diversion program. So juveniles who have been convicted of a misdemeanor crime, our students uh, get to sentence them. And so the students go training through the uh, Maricopa uh, Juvenile Court System. We've actually set up a classroom at Williamsfield High School with, to, to uh, look like a courtroom. So it's got a jury box, it's got a judge's bench, a witness stand. Our students are the prosecuting attorneys, the defending attorneys, the victim's advocates, the judge and the jury. And they work with the, uh, with the uh, assailant and determine the um, consequence that that person will uh, um, we'll have to uh, work out to, uh, to uh, uh, continue uh, being a good citizen and not have that uh, charge being on their record. So they have a court hearing about once a month and uh, our students uh, got recognition by the Maricopa County Justice System last year. Uh, they actually had a celebration for them for the work that they do. Uh, digital photography program at Williamsfield High School. Um, uh, finished nationally uh, in the top 10% in categories like best cover, best end sheet, best design, best divider. Uh, the yearbook program, uh, or the, graph the digital photography program and their yearbook uh, uh, activities over there continue to just excel. And uh, they went to camp this summer where they got to work with national people from uh, uh, national experts in yearbooks and, and photography, and they're probably gonna knock it out of the park again this year. It's, just, it's become a standard now. So um, early childhood, again, we added the, the third year at Williamsfield as well, and technical theater we added as a new program this year. 
We are currently working with the PR department to update the website. Um, the CTE website was old and sad and it was ready to retire. And so we were working on updating it with all of our new programs. We're making it more interactive. Uh, we're ensuring that all the photos on there are students of Higley Unified School District. Um, and uh, putting uh, things like the highlights on the bottom and, and uh, making sure that CTE is highlighted, not just at the, the district web pages, but also on all the CTE web pages. Uh, in the near future, we'll have program pages that have all of that information I talked about, those programs. It'll have Labor Bureau statistics on there, average starting wages, the number of credits our students are getting for each of the community college uh, programs that they work with. So people, when they look at our programs, will be able to determine exactly what that program is gonna be. One other thing that Higley uh, started doing last year is we started partnering with Queen Creek and Combs School District to create regional advisory boards for each of our programs. Um, one of the legislative requirements of a CTE program is that they have industry and business partners advise them and support their programs. Um, in smaller districts like Higley, Queen Creek, and Combs, sometimes it's difficult to find a large pool of industry partners that want, can or were willing to spend time with you. Um, it's also difficult as a teacher to find other colleagues to speak with about your program and to um, share ideas with and collaborate. And so the three CT directors got together last year and we said, you know, let's go ahead and test this with a couple of our programs, see how it goes. Um, the word got out to our other programs and by mid-year they were all asking when their regional advisory boards were going to happen. And so we have uh, this year set up regional advisory boards with all of our programs with the exception of one, which is criminal justice, and that's because we have a regional advisory board that stretches much further than the Southeast Valley. Um, we're, we actually do a regional advisory board with Scottsdale, Mesa, um, Gilbert, and Queen Creek. So. Um, but the idea behind the regional advisory board is that we bring career clusters together, so we'll bring all of our health science programs together. We'll talk about things that are, are specific to that career cluster. We'll work on um, you know, needs and, and listen to our industry partners tell us what the needs are out in the industry. And then we'll break out by specific programs. So uh, like in our graphic information programs, we'll break out into digital photography, graphic design, digital communications. And then they'll work individually with business partners and their colleagues from the other schools um, with the goal that they will create a plan of action or a program of work for our region. So now our business partners in the region know if they come to Queen Creek, Combs, or Higley and are looking for a student in one of these programs that they're going to get the same type of outcome. Um, and then the teachers bring that back. They still have their own advisory boards that they work with at the school level, but those are a little bit more informal. And they bring those plans of actions back to their own individual advisory boards and those people that work specifically with their program, and they try to align all of those goals. So this regional approach is something that's unique. It's not something that has been tried a whole lot in the state. Um, we'll actually be presenting on this at our conference up in, a, uh, in a Prescott next month. Uh, and so uh, I think this, is, this will end up taking off as, as something that you'll see throughout the state. But our, our teachers are definitely getting a, a huge benefit out of this. So. CTE funding. So just wanted to kind of update everybody on the, the funding that we're getting for the year and let you know where we're, uh, where we're at. So our funding comes from four primary sources. Uh, the, the major source is through the state, through the CTED funds, and that fund, those funds are funneled through EVIT and allocated to us by the state. Uh, that makes up about $2.3 million of our budget. Uh, we also get a federal Perkins grant. Right now it's about $95,000, but we'll, it, it'll go up to about $130,000, $140,000 when it's fully funded. It was supposed to be fully funded by the state on September 30th, but it will be here soon, they say. Uh, state priority, same thing. We're about 60% funded. It'll go up to about $100,000 in funding. Uh, and then we receive a little bit of funding from the governor's office uh, through an air, a program called the Arizona Industrial uh, Credentials Incentive Fund. Um, this was kind of his way of testing the system. Uh, for the last four or five years, um, or actually about seven or eight years, the uh, CTED superintendents across the state have been saying, it's impossible to offer certifications. And so the government said, 
I'm gonna put $5 million aside and everybody who gets the certification in a high needs, high wage industry, I'll pay, I'll pay for $1,000 for it. All of a sudden, within three years, that funding was, was used up and everybody was being able to offer certifications. So he did like most governors do, and he said, okay, you proved to me that you can do it, I'm pulling the funding. So that program ends this year, but proof of concept, right? Um, so of that $2.5 million that, that we get every year, or that we're getting this year, about 1.4 million of that goes to cover our teacher salaries. So that's where the vast majority of that funding goes. Um, we always set aside or try to hold back a, a, for a reserve for new programs. Um, it was welcome that we did this during the COVID outbreak because we found out all of a sudden that we needed to buy some computers that were a little bit more than the one-to-ones that the students were using uh, for our graphic design programs and our, our technology programs. And so we were able to spend some funding on that. Um, but we always hold, try to reserve a little bit for that rainy day or, or, or new programs. Uh, the remaining $650,000 is budgeted to supplies, equipment, professional development, student conferences and competitions, uh, travel, and then teacher incentives. So, and now the fun, again to the fun part, I would have the honor to introduce to you Mr. John Levsock, our graphic design teacher over at Higley High School, and two very amazing young ladies, Lily Valencia and Estefania Sandez. President Kaler, board members, district uh, administrators, we appreciate you allowing us to be here tonight. I took over the graphic design program four years ago. This is year five. We have contributed to the growth of the print shop and doing work throughout the district so students are getting hands-on working. We have also been a top 10% national yearbook as well. And the big piece has been Skills USA. We have six national statesmen, which is an award that less than 1% of 380,000 members nationwide earn. We have 15 regional officers over four years, three state officers, and one national officers. So with that, we have developed our legacy of leadership, and the students understand that there is a ladder of leadership, where they progress from being a chapter officer to regional officer to state, and if they have time, a national officer. We have with us tonight the SkillsUSA Arizona state reporter, who represents 13,000 members statewide with Estefania Sandez. And we have the SkillsUSA secondary secretary, who represents over 380,000 members with the national organization. The other thing that Lily has earned is she is the joint executive council chair. This means that among the members of the national officer team, she was selected for her leadership to represent them on the SkillsUSA National Governing Board. So she attends governing board meetings, she meets with CEOs from Caterpillar to Lowe's to Ford. She is representing business and industry representation with SkillsUSA as well as 380,000 members. This is an exclusive thing and she is actually probably the first in the state of Arizona to ever hold this position. So she represents Higley Unified in a very dignified manner and these young ladies have demonstrated that they are quality leaders that stand above and beyond. And I'd like to give them time to talk about their experiences. Hi, everyone. I'm really happy to be here with you tonight. Um, I just want to thank Mr. Lubsuck. Um, I don't think, I think both of us could say that we wouldn't be where we are today without him. He's a really great advisor, and I'm excited for that. Um, he also very well said our roles. Um, I'm the National Secretary, um, and I just want to go ahead and talk about some of the experiences that I've had through SkillsUSA because they've been really positive in shaping me and who I am today. Um, so first, the National Leadership and Skills Conference. This happens in June every year, and it happened in Atlanta this previous year. Um, so in being a national candidate, I really was able to focus on campaigning and talking and networking with people from across the nation. It is really cool because it's not an experience that an average high schooler gets to have. I got to go and I had to stand up in front of 200 delegates from across the country, some of them from Puerto Rico, um, Maine, Michigan, Florida, like 
basically everywhere in the US. And so they were able to ask me a series of questions, like ser um, a controversial question, and I was able to go ahead and like give my speech. Um, and then we were able to go in sessions and they voted for us. And it's really cool because now I'm elected um, as a national secretary on my team with someone from Maine. Um, we also have someone from Missouri and other states like Georgia. So it's really cool to be able to have this kind of platform because not only am I getting these experiences by getting to go places to like trainings to DC, but I'm also able to voice um, the mem the voice the opinions of the members, as Lebslock said, on the board. So I also get to, got to experience NLSE, and it was amazing seeing Lily elected as a national, as a part of the national officer team. Um, along with NLSC, we got to experience leverage training, which was a state officer training, and it helped us implement any skills and our program of work at those workshops into our terms as state officers throughout the year. So it was just amazing being able to network with hundreds of members from all around the country and meeting people that I never thought I would meet in my life. And it was just amazing creating so many bonds and friendships. Along with that were many quirks of SkillsUSA, such as the SkillsUSA Festival, the pin trading, the Texpo, which was where you got to go onto the platform where the members were having their competitions. And it was just, it was live competition. So you had competitions from welding to cosmetology. It was just a really huge stretch of how many skills and how many events there were within that platform. Along with that, you were able to walk down the aisles and there were business and industry partners and you were able to speak to them and talk to them and they were able to also advocate about their business to you as you were also advocating to them about skills you to say at the same time. So it was honestly just an amazing experience. NLSE was a highlight because again, this is an experience that high school students not, don't get to experience all the time. So very grateful for that. Well, ladies. So we have a few more experiences that we'd like to share. Um, I feel like there's a lot of opportunities within SkillsUSA for students to experience. And one of that is through trainings. So as elected officers, we've both been able to attend a number of trainings. Um, this past summer, I was able to fly over to DC and I was able to see the SkillsUSA national headquarters and meet the SkillsUSA national staff along with learning more about the program of work and CTE information in general. And through all of that, now I feel like I'm an educated ambassador who can really accurately tell people about SkillsUSA and just the wide variety of opportunities that students can have. Because before I joined SkillsUSA, I feel like I was really, um, I would say a little bit shy and didn't really talk to people. And so being able to be a student who came from that and now being able to speak in front of a room like this clearly, um, I feel like is just inspiring. So being able to do that to students and to show them, hey, you have these opportunities too. You can go to conferences, you can network with people from across the nation, you can create these lifelong friendships and it really is important. And I would say a little bit more important than some of those experiences that you may just gain in the classroom because your, your network really is your net worth. So being able to create some of those connections. Um, yeah. So alongside my trainings were slightly different than Lily's because I'm at the state level, but either way, it's again being able to grow these certain skills. Uh, I was never able to public speak. I was never put in a position to public speak and it was just amazing learning different qualities that you need as a public speaker and a facilitator. So that was more what my trainings were revolved around, just increasing and improving myself as a leader and as a uh, figure to the members of SkillsUSA and being able, again, to advocate to them and speak to them and answer any questions that they have and just provide for them as an officer. And again, with advocating, that brings us into WLTI, which is the Washington Leadership Training Institute, and I'm sure Lily has great information. <laughs> so provide, besides providing a lot of opportunities for students to compete in their CTE program, whatever that may be, we also have the Washington Leadership Training Institute, which is another nationwide event where students, um, and even students from other CTE programs, they all come over to DC and we learn about advocacy. As a national officer this year, I was actually able to facilitate these workshops. So I personally was able to teach a group of students what exactly is advocacy, being in support of something. And then we were able to go and analyze CTE hot topics 
they were able to learn about the Perkins funding. So that way they could plan out their legislative visit and have a, legis like a conversation with their local, le their local legislator in DC. And that way we can continue to support CTE. And it really just does make a difference. I feel like some of you, like before the meeting, pointed out, it's different to hear from a student perspective um, and just to like hear the experiences that CTE and Skills USA really is having an impact on our development as individuals and our ability to be career ready, like even out of high school. And so the Washington Leadership Training Institute, I would say it's just an amazing opportunity, one for advocacy, but also networking, like we said before. And our most recent event was the Fall Leadership Conference, which is actually two weeks ago, I believe. And there was actually basically the kickoff for Skills USA for many members or students that wanted to see what Skills USA was all about. So we actually had over 2,000 students attend that conference, and it was amazing. That was my first actual conference where I got to be on stage and actually speak to all these members. So it was very nerve wracking, but honestly, it was amazing being able to speak to them and just finally showcase all the training and the preparation that we've been through to finally showcase that on stage and through facilitations and workshops. I had a workshop along with Lily and many other um, business and industry partners that were also there and public speakers that were giving their workshops. My workshop was on teamwork and just hands-on activities on how they can embed these teamwork exercises into their teams back at their school or in their chapters or in their regional officers as well. But again, uh, the FLC was just, again, the kickoff for SkillsUSA, and I would say that it was definitely a huge success and an overall great experience. So one of the other events that we had earlier this year was chapter officer training, and that was the first time ever that any students from the Higley Unified School District were going over um, to go to a training to learn about the program of work. And so it was a really cool opportunity because Steph and I were able to facilitate. Um, because Skills USA is kind of emerging newly in this district, um, we were able to tell them more about Skills USA and more about the program of work. So like Craig was saying, it's basically your plan of action for the year. And so making sure that we can provide students the pathway to planning, making sure that they are hitting their advocacy and marketing, their community engagement, and things like partner and alumni engagements. Um, but also making sure as they plan events that they are intentionally developing skills, which is something that I was able to learn a lot at national training. And so being able to pass down some of that information to um, the local level is really important to me and it was really powerful as these students were really excited to put some of these events in play, um, which is really important because Skills USA is a student-led organization. So it's really cool to see that all come together and I'm really excited for the year and what they bring back. But yeah, just to tie it all together, like Lily said, overall, I'm excited as well to see how these events carry on throughout the year and how much we could see members grow from the beginning of the year to the end because you can genuinely see it as you see them all across the events. So overall, Skills USA is an amazing organization that just helps serves members and keeps these doors open and allows students to take on different pathways that they never thought they had access to, so thank you for having us. Ladies, you are phenomenal, mm -hmm. professional, <laughs> very polished young women, and I don't know, I'm, I'm not your mama, but I feel so proud that <laughs> you are our Higley students tonight. I, I, I really am kind of speechless right now at your accomplishments on our behalf and how well you represent us out there. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We're very, very proud of you both. Also, I'd love to know, what are your future plans after Higley, each one of you? Um, okay, I'll go first. So I would say I'm a little bit undecided, still trying to figure it out. Um, I have applied to the Arizona schools, and I've been accepted to ASU, NAU, and U of A. Um, however, I think I want to travel outside of Arizona, gain some new experiences. Um, so right now I'm looking at applying to the University of Oregon, 
um, the University of Chicago and Stanford, but that's more of a reach, so kind of just keeping my goals high. Um, and I'm thinking of going into something medical. I know it's not related to graphic design, but I really okay. do admire the skills that I've gained, and yeah. Your, your, your future is very bright. Wherever you end up, they'll be lucky to have you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Say your name for us again. Me? Yes. Oh, Estefania. Estef it's so pretty. OK, go ahead. Yeah. Where are you uh, headed? Huh? What school are oh. you? Are your plans after Higley? OK, so, um, I am also undecided. I'm not quite sure. Uh, I am going to college, though. I've been accepted to um, NAU, U of A, and ASU. So that's pretty good. And yes, um, <laughs> yes it is. <laughs> yeah. We um, concur. So for me, I'm kind of, since I'm undecided and I'm not quite sure which could change throughout the course of this year, um, I'm kind of leaning towards uh, going to community college first mm -hmm. and figuring that out and then going into a university, transferring into university. But the fields that I'm interested in, which is kind of a long reach, <laughs> because they're both on complete opposite sides, but is being a neurologist and in neurology and um, communications field, the graphics, the marketing, just any uh, working for companies on the marketing side is what interests me as well. But yeah. Awesome. Thank you for asking. Awesome. Go ahead. We have some questions maybe up here if you're up for it. Always. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. You guys did fantastic. I'm going to echo what Mrs. Kaler said and just say ditto because that was fantastic. Um, how do you think we could encourage kids to join CTE, especially maybe our freshmen and sophomores that want to do like a three-year program? How, what advice would you give us, I guess, to encourage? How could we do that? Um, I would go ahead and start off by saying just like increasing, um, showing what we do perhaps, like maybe on social media, because I know that has become a very apparent thing. But also um, we could go out to middle schools and we could go there and tell them about Skills USA and the experiences. Um, we could show them like some of the things we get to do like within competitions. Um, previously I was able to like compete in advertising design. So being able to show like, hey, like we get to take photos, you get to use Adobe Photoshop. like. These are all like opportunities that you're gonna have in high school. And I feel like really just showcasing it in that way um, would make it more apparent that this is an opportunity for them. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Did you have anything to add, Estefania? Did uh, I say it right? Yeah. Okay, yeah, okay. fantastic. So I'm sorry, whenever I say totally it. Okay. Fine. <laughs> um, uh, I would say the same exact thing, basically. That's honestly a very good answer. Um, for me, CTE, graphic design, kind of just fell into my life. I was like looking at the selected courses and I was like, oh, graphic design. I was like, I'll do it. <laughs> so I clicked it. So that's basically how I got into CTE. And I think that's also definitely a different way to get into CTE. And I think many students at schools also kind of ran into CTE with the same way that I did too. But yeah, Lily's answer was spot on with <laughs> they, they didn't mention this, but part of the program work, which is our pathway, they're currently working on a plan to go to Sossman and to integrate this already. So that's why they are familiar with an answer for you. So I just wanted to add that they did not mention this, but they are already in the planning process, probably for a January event to promote the program as well as SkillsUSA and CTE at our feeder school Sossman. So plans are still being developed, and once we have all that, we will. They, they will be integrating it because this is student-led. So just wanted to add that, that they're doing phenomenal things. <laughs> Dr. Foley, will that also happen at Williamsfield going down to Cooley? Or do you know? Maybe I'm sorry. I hate to like just throw you. OK, sorry. <laughs> President Gator, Board Member Wilson, yes. And when, when we get to the next slide, when they talk about what are the, some of the work that we're doing, you'll hear some more about what we're planning on doing. President Kaler. Ladies, again, we can't say how proud we are of you and how you represent us. And I don't, I heard you say, you know, it's not graphic design. Um, don't worry about that because it's these skills that are gonna take you somewhere. And it's just ironic. I have this example today that my son participated in graphic design, not to the same level, obviously, as you, as you ladies, but had a leadership interview today and part of his practice um, 
for that interview was going back to he was um, an editor-in-chief and had some leadership roles within the yearbook and graphic design. And so he was reaching back to those skills for this, this job interview that has nothing to do with graphic design or anything, but he's relying and, and going back on the skills that he's learned. So don't, don't even think it's because it's not graphic design that you're going into. The leadership skills that you're learning will, that's going to carry you forward. And you have represented it amazingly. And I'm so excited for you guys and for our district. And it's like, how do we do more? How do we do more? Because this is, this is amazing where you can contribute, obviously, a lot in your role. But it also sounds like you don't have to contribute that much time and everything, but you can still get a lot out of it. So um, that's very exciting. I'm excited that you guys represent us because you're fantastic ladies and um, I'm excited for your future, but don't, don't even worry on where you go. It's the skills and the, uh, what you're learning now is what will, will go with you. Yes, ladies, all I want to ask, though, is at that competition for the child development class, was it like a race on who could change a diaper the quickest? <laughs> or, like, how did they? <laughs> I can only imagine all those different CTE opportunities in the competitions that they had. So I don't mean you to answer that. It was just <laughs> <laughs> But ladies, truly, we are very proud of you. Thank you for coming tonight and sharing with us. Very, very well done, ladies. Thank you so much. Thank you for your time. Thank you. So there, CTE, done. <laughs> um, again, could not be more proud of the accomplishments of these two young ladies and the leadership from their teacher and just all the opportunities that they've been able to do because of that, so. Um, speaking of future opportunities, uh, our possible future opportunities that we're looking at in CTE currently um, is trying to align with the, with the middle school a little bit more and looking at some of the CTE programs we're offering down there as well at, and, and working with those programs to create a more clear pathway to the, some of the programs at the high school um, as well as potentially future to, to look at some other type of opportunities at the middle school. Uh, we, we have currently over the last few years had CTE programs going down to the middle schools and doing uh, presentations and lunchtime activities for students to be able to understand what their programs are and we will definitely continue doing that. Um, another exciting opportunity we have right now that we have more room at Higley High School or we will soon in the future uh, is adding a couple of new programs to the Higley High School uh, menu as well. Uh, one program that we're looking at potentially starting at the beginning of next year is a medical program. Uh, we did a survey, currently we have over 1,200 survey uh, responses, uh, and overwhelmingly the programs that our middle school parents and students and high school parents and students are interested in are a medical assisting or a physical therapy technician program. And so we are looking at, we've, we've already uh, submitted a request to EVIT to be approved to, to start a program next year in one of those areas, and we're waiting to hear back from them on that. Um, we have a unique opportunity at Williamsfield High School as we have a business and industry partner who has been uh, we're trying, working with us over the last year to um, create a, a, a specific uh, pipe welding program at Williamsfield High School, and it is the Arizona Pipe Trades Union. They're currently looking for about 450 pipe welders, uh, and the pipeline is dry. Um, and so uh, I know there was a, a question uh, about why a pipe welding program. When we have a business industry partner come in and want to financially support a program, uh, academically support a program, and help support a teacher and, and, and build that program out, uh, it is the ideal way to start a CTE program, uh, having that business and industry support first. Um, one, of the, one of the things that we were talking about with this program is these students, when they fit and complete the program and graduate high school, would automatically be accepted into an apprenticeship program into the Arizona Pipe Trades Union. So that's, that's a pretty big deal. Uh, that is a career starter for kids, and that's a career starter with zero debt. And for our Gen Z kids, that is one of their top priorities is to be debt adverse. So 
Um, and uh, there is a, even though the welding isn't growing nationally, I did some research today and I looked at that. Um, welding is looking at growing at one to 2% nationally, but there are projected over the next 10 years, 47,000 job openings a year because of retirements and because people are leaving the industry. And so there is a, still a huge need for welders, both here in the state of Arizona, as well as the, uh, the country, so. Uh, and then our last, our, uh, one of our things that we'll be focusing on over the next year or so is our program outcomes. Again, we're offering uh, certifications and licenses in every program now, so now the goal is to focus on pass rates. Uh, we're currently sitting at about a 75% pass rate on those certifications and licenses. We'd like to push that up to about 80% or above. Uh, it will definitely make us one of the top school districts in the state if we can have that, that type of results. So with that, what questions do you have for me? Any questions? President Kaler? Yes, Mrs. Reese. So I know in the past when we've had a specific program only at one school, we have allowed or accommodated for a student to go from either Higley to Williamsfield or Williamsfield to Higley for that particular class. Is that something that we would still look to do for the medical assisting and, and try and work schedules that way? And are we doing that with biotech since it's not being offered at Higley anymore? Yeah, I tease Mr. or Mr. Crosby teases me all the time about me needing to buy a bus for the district. Um, we're currently busing kids four periods a day to the early childhood center for uh, classes. We're busing kids back and forth from Williamsville to Higley for uh, ROTC and for that biotech program if students are interested. And yes, the program, if it's offered at Higley High School, will be open to both schools. And I think that's just important that we share that, that they can still attend their school of choice, their home school, however they want to go, but would still have the opportunity to partake in this in these programs that Absolutely. are at available, um, and that they don't have to go far away for that. So yeah, um, the Scottsdale School District uses a different model where they have specific magnet schools, basically. So if you're going to be in culinary arts, you're going to Chaparral. And the district will bus you there to Chaparral, but it will become your home school. And if you want to be a medical student, you go to Saguaro High School. Um, and, that, and they'll bus kids from anywhere in the district to Saguaro for that. Um, I agree, uh, we, students that have grown up together, have gone through elementary, middle school together, want to attend high school together. Uh, they've built that camaraderie and that teamwork. Um, and so if that opportunity is not there, we just make sure that they have that opportunity. Just piggybacking on what Ms. Therese said, how do they find out that they can go to a different school? To, for that, how, how do they um, The primary way is through their course guide and their counselors. Okay. Um, and I'm sorry. I, President Kaler, uh, Ms. Schultz, uh, the primary way is they find out through their counselors um, or through the course guide. So the course guide will say that a program is available at both schools. Um, currently the biotech program I think says that it's available at Williamsfield, but Higley students uh, can be transported to it. Um, okay. The same thing will be the case for a medical program if we offer it at Higley High School. Okay, thank you. Oh, one question, sorry, one more. Um, the grants that you talked about, are those long-term? Uh, are there those in danger of going away? I forgot what, I'm sorry, I wrote a... Yeah, so there's there's the, the three the, there's the, the three grant uh, pools. Uh, the federal Perkins grant is a 15 month grant. So it goes from July 1st to September 30th uh, of the following year. The priority grant is a 12 month grant. So it goes from June, uh, July 1st to June 30th. And this, the incentive grant has been a carryover grant, but since it's going away, we've been told to spend the money. So, since it's going away, you said what? It's, since that one's going away, we've, we've been told to spend the money this year. Okay. <laughs> yes. Governments have a tendency and to pull that back. When that does go away, will it affect the ability to do certifications? Or I'm sorry, what? When that does go away, how will it affect the ability for certifications? It won't. Okay. My model is that we will always be able to offer certifications to our students and we'll pay for those certifications. Okay. Maybe you said that and I missed that. I'm sorry. Uh, I just want to thank you. Both my kids have benefited from having CTE. Both of them have done different CTE. My son did two or three different classes, not knowing quite what he wanted to do, and my daughter's currently doing one. Um, she really enjoyed it, or is enjoying it. It makes her excited to go to school, which is always something in high school that you're not quite sure about, but it's very exciting to see that. Um, and I did get to see the criminal justice probably at the start 
it would have been my first or second year on the board we went over and viewed um, Hickley High School's criminal justice program and it was fantastic they had a crime scene set up in one of the rooms it was absolutely one of the best uh, CTE that I had seen offered with the crime scene and the kids were using like the light to check for fingerprints it was pretty fabulous um, and I'm excited to see that that program is still continuing and doing so well so thank you thank you Thank you. Uh, I get very excited whenever we talk CTE. Um, I think it's life changing um, for, for students and sitting in high schools and I, I, I see it all the time where there's, there's students they just don't know what they want to do but now with the CTE programs that have been um, running and, and growing and in my opinion it's so sophisticated here and the options are just, um, they have value. So you mentioned about the marketability but um, I see it as that it gives meaning to school to some of these students. Like they've had to show up since kindergarten and it was fun for a while. And then it hits junior high and high school and we're like, why are we here? And even teachers like, why are you here? <laughs> but this gives a meaning. It's not a dumping ground for kids that aren't going to college now. These two young women have proven that it's, it is building these skills. And as Ms. Reese stated, you know, her, her sons, how he has uh, been able to use um, the skills that he gained um, to hopefully get a job, um, whatever, whatever he's working for. So I just wanted to, I just wanted to just say, I, I, I'm grateful for everything you are doing and you seem to be doing it very well. Um, like I said, I don't want these classes to be dumping grounds. It, it looks like, at least from these two young women, that it, it's um, being handled very well. Um, and I wanted to address uh, uh, Ms. Valencia and Ms. Sandez, like it's, it's beyond um, what you are, how you're growing through this you two have become, whether you like it or not, difference makers. So you have now gained the skills to help the, the students below you and they're watching you and they're learning from you. And it, so it's, it's bigger than just you. And, and I, um, you handle yourselves very well and, and I think you are truly, like I said, difference, difference makers. So thank you for sharing. All of that to my one question is, <laughs> how uh, are you getting, and I say to here, how do you track the non-traditional students to the programs? Do you have a method or is it just they just kind of show up because you your numbers were uh, above stake? President Kaler, uh, Ms. Anderson. Um, in some cases that we're fortunate, um, I will tell you all programs and their successes are based off their teachers. There's absolutely no way that our programs would be the successes they are without the teachers that we have in place. Um, our programs that are non-traditional, we discuss and have, talk about strategies to attract and retain non-traditional students in those programs. Um, there are certain programs that um, are, I would say, more heavily influenced by society and culture to be a, a traditional path or not a non-traditional path than others. Uh, we have some programs that uh, do a tremendous job. Our criminal justice program is a uh, female non-traditional program, uh, yet we have about 45% of our students in that program are female. Uh, they're very interested in that. Um, our engineering program, uh, I, Engineering as an industry has about a five to, or five percent or less female participation in. Our engineering programs have about seven to eight percent female participation. Uh, we market things uh, with females. Uh, we give all of the opportunities to all of our female students to go to events that are pro-female in STEM careers and engineering careers. Um, both high schools are going to be attending an event at Scottsdale Community College called Girls Get It. It's a specific uh, program based around females in STEM careers. Um, so we, we continue to, to offer those opportunities. Culturally and societally, it's just not a program that a lot of females see themselves in. Um, so we continue to try to encourage students and those teachers in that. We had an all-female uh, uh, robotics team at Williamsfield High School last year. Um, and one of the things we kept pushing with them is uh, ASU about three years ago had an all-female uh, robotics team that placed second in the world. So there are people close to home for them that they can use as mentors and, and uh, that, but uh, we just continue, you know, saying that trying to make all of the programs accessible to every student that's interested. Thank you, Mr. Pearson. I too have a have a uh, an engineer student back in the day who uh, went on to become a pilot, and that's a tough tough 
women in aviation, let me tell you, it's not, a, it's not an easy gig. So I appreciate everything you do for the ladies that are trying to really kind of break some glass ceilings um, in our community. So well done. Great How's presentation. Hitler, thank you. This is our why, and we don't always get to see our why. So Absolutely. thank you for bringing uh, these fabulous women tonight, and Mr. Lepsock too. Thank you for all you do, and we really appreciate this tonight. Thank you. And ladies, you don't have to stay. Or Mr. Lepsock, we understand. <laughs> Thank you. Have a, have a great night. <laughs> Next up, we get the Tyler Moore Show again. 7.2, our annual financial report. Yes. Good evening, President Kaler, members of the board. Um, it is that time of year uh, where we report out our fiscal year expenditures for the prior fiscal year that uh, just ended June 30th. So with that, uh, just a refresher, what is the AFR? This is our all-encompassing um, report out of every single financial transaction that has occurred um, from July 1 uh, to June 30, our, our fiscal year. Uh, it also includes an encumbrance period, but um, I won't go into the weeds too much there. Um, this report is required by the Arizona Auditor General um, and the Arizona Department of Education. Uh, this report needs to be submitted to um, Arizona Auditor General by October 15th, uh, which brings us here on October 12th, uh, prior to the deadline. So um, this, this report encompasses a number of different supplemental forms. Um, the main um, AFR is, is the, the nine-page document that you'll approve tonight uh, in the action item. Um, but listed there are some of the other reports that are included. Um, and they just keep adding them. They don't typically take away reports. Um, it's not typical of government. Um, so th this year, new this year, is a COVID uh, relief funding report. So again, all these reports um, that we do are submitted up to the Arizona Department of Education and are available on our website um, if any community member uh, were to be interested in reviewing those. Just a few highlights from the 22 AFR. Um, this year, we had over $157 million in total expenditures. This is all funds, not just in our operational budget. It's an increase of approximately 9% over last fiscal year. Um, again, it showcases kind of our growth of, of our district um, as we grow both employees and the cost to run our district. We also had over 344,000 various accounting transactions, which was an increase of approximately 20% over fiscal year 21. Um, I, I just wanted to acknowledge all the finance, human resource, and payroll staff who are accounted for each and every one of these transactions. Um, ensuring the district is one compliant uh, with state and federal laws, um, which is showcased in our audit, which will be presented here soon. But in 2021, we had a clean audit and we anticipate a, a clean audit in 2022 as well. So diving into the fiscal year 22 annual financial report, I've done my best to estimate what the classroom spending report will look like. So the, um, after the AFRs are submitted, the Arizona Auditor General um, compiles a classroom spending report. Um, this report is compiled, um, again, after all the AFRs are submitted and released in early November. This report as well it will be posted on our website once it's uh, finalized. But in this est uh, fiscal year 22 estimate, um, we did not see much change from the prior year. Um, as a reminder, this report is a representation of all expenditures. This is not just an operational expenditure uh, pie graph. Um, going into this report a little, starting with the largest percentage of the pie, um, Higley Unified spent 60% of its funds um, in the classroom. And so uh, we continue to be uh, well above the state average. This is approximately 5% above the state average, uh, and also 5% above our peer districts. Oh, so. Um, sticking with classroom spending, uh, the student support uh, area is 6% of our total expenditures. Um, this area is approximately 3% below the state average. Um, student support is defined by expenditures for counselors, speech pathologists, nurses, social workers, and attendance services individuals. Um, as you know, in our budget process, the district has worked to address um, insert funding more counselors. Um, we do have a district counselor and we have now 
uh, three counselors at our, that, to meet uh, the nine school, elementary schools in their district. So, Still in the classroom area, the instructional spending, uh, instructional support category represents approximately 5% of the total expenditures. Uh, this is in line with state averages. Uh, state averages is approximately 5% as well. Uh, instructional support includes expenditures for librarians, teachers, curriculum development, media specialists, and others in this area. Transitioning to the non-classroom spending, which, which represents about 29% of the district's uh, total expenditures for fiscal 22. The administrative um, pie represents 10% of the total expenditures for fiscal 22. Uh, this represents a small increase over last fiscal year. Uh, however, Higley continues to be the lowest uh, percentage spend within its peer groups, as well as 4% lower than the state average. Uh, so the state average for administrative spending is approximately 14%. Um, Higley remains at 10%. Next, uh, plant expenditures. Uh, this represents op plant operations, um, so equipment repair, building maintenance, custodial services, grounds, and also property insurances in this category. Um, Higley is the lowest among its peer groups and is approximately 2% below the state average. And the last two categories, food service and transportation. Transportation spending is slightly below the state average. Uh, we, we are only 24 square miles, and so uh, while we do drive a lot for our, our programs, um, we do not have the miles uh, uh, that, we, that other districts may have. And then food service, um, slightly higher than the state average by approximately 1%. Diving into um, a little bit of our budget controlled funds and our cash controlled funds, kind of the two main uh, points of emphasis in this report. First, I wanted to just explain and, and provide an example what budget and cash controlled funds are. So as a reminder, budget controlled funds are formula generated by average daily membership. Uh, we talk about this in our budget process and in a lot of our budget conversations. It, the main examples of this include our maintenance and operations fund and our capital outlay fund. On the other side of the ticket, uh, cash controlled funds. These are funds generated by revenues. Um, and so I'll cover these four uh, specific cash controlled funds that are district uh, obligated, or excuse me, district run. That includes food service operations, civic center. This is also where our rentals go into. Community schools and, and the preschool fund and indirect cost fund. So first looking at our budgeted expenditures, I'm gonna look at uh, the M&O ending ca uh, cash balance versus budget balance. Um, the ending cash balance is highlighted there in the dark uh, blue on the graph, and then the ending budget balance um, is in the light blue. So ending cash with a budget controlled fund is not uh, money that we have available to spend. Um, I just went over what a budget controlled fund is. Um, this is budget driven, and so we can only spend what is um, ending budget balance. We cannot spend cash. Um, I think in, in previous reports, we've, we've talked about how um, the cash balance has been rising. Um, you'll notice in fiscal 22, we're starting to bring that down, and you do that through a, um, when we um, work with the Maricone County Superintendent's Office to set our property tax rates. So essentially, we would not um, tax for as much as our budget would need because we have excess cash. So that is how we're bringing that down and eventually we'll get that to where they're the same. Um, three main points on this graph. Uh, first, starting in fiscal year 20, the federal government started issuing um, rounds of COVID relief funding. Um, and thereafter, it's, there's been two additional rounds of COVID relief funding, each getting larger. Um, this has contributed to the, the larger uh, ending budget balance carry forward that you see represented in fiscal 22. Um, number two, the fiscal 22 ending budget balance is approximately 23 million. It's just above what we earmarked in our budget process um, when we were discussing our adopted and proposed budget back in July. Um, some of the increase is related to vacancy savings, but if you remember, the district earmarked 22 million to carry over uh, to this fiscal year. Um, because of my last point, the aggregate expenditure limit is still upon us. So 
Um, the ending budget balance, we purposely budgeted higher to cover um, the ending, the ramifications of the aggregate expenditure limit, potentially not being exempted from the legislature. Um, we, we took us into our own hands and, and again, um, allocated for a higher budget balance carry forward. So there'd be no impact to our students and staff this year if the legislature does not make an action. Um, ideally, the AEL is not just fixed for this year, but fixed permanently. And we can, get, we can then budget to bring this, or plan to bring this budget balance down um, to roughly four to 10% is a conservative number when you don't have the aggregate expenditure limit um, pending. President Reese. Or, I'm sorry, President Kaler. I'm sorry, like, I, I don't know. I looked at you and thought, Reese, I'm so sorry. Uh, yeah, maybe it is the dark hair. It's the change. Mr. Moore, um, the AEL has to be voted on in a every four-year election. Is that correct? Oh, it can be voted on any time. Okay, they, so they could vote. They could put it on our ballot. I thought it had to go onto our ballot every during the presidential election. Is that correct? No, so the... Or the... the uh, I don't know. Hold on, hold on. The aggregate so, spending... No? So the aggregate expenditure limit, expenditure yeah. Expenditure limit, yes. Yeah, so that that is... Um, uh, I thought it had a, to be voted. A limit that was... I, I just explained this uh, to a community member uh, just earlier. So just to recap, the aggregate expenditure limit is a, is a formula. It's, it's in statute. Mm -hmm. um, it's a formula that the Arizona Department of Education runs every year. Um, just the last couple of years, we, we've started to overreach uh, that right. limit. So that, that, that limit was... And this was voted on in the 80s, correct? Okay. Correct, yeah. I'm like, let me make sure that I know what I'm talking about. That's what I thought. Okay, thank you. Mrs. Yeah. Kaler provided me some research. Okay. You can keep going, and then I'll read, and I'll yeah. let you know if so I have a question. Just in short, yeah. So that limit uh, stems from a 1980s uh, st statute. Um, and so um, with the influx of COVID relief funding over the last couple of years, we, the districts as a whole in the state have exceeded that limit the last two years. As you know, the legislature at the ninth hour um, exempted school districts from having to cut their budgets uh, from that limit, but that was a one-year exemption. Um, so again, this year, um, the formula is already showing that we're exceeding the limit by 1.3 billion. And so that's approximately a 16% cut uh, to our district budget, which equates to about $20 million um, if that limit is not exempted this year. Uh, so again, th this will reoccur annually if the legislature does not do a permanent fix to the K-12 funding formula that would um, basically fix this formula that's old and outdated. Thank you. Thank you for explaining it to me. Now it's yeah. all coming back. It's all rushing back, to back okay. from last year. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. So we purposely planned for that, and we took um, it into our own hands and ensured Higley was not going to be affected from this regardless of what happens. Moving to our other main budget fund, our capital fund. Um, I provided a similar look back of the last four fiscal years. Um, this is uh, comparing budget in the, the dark blue to expenditures, actual expenditures. Um, the, district, the district has previously discussed a little bit about the budget balance in the capital fund, um, not kind of having a plan um, in, in why the, there's been a large carryover year after year. Um, but as you've known, we've been bringing a capital budget to you um, over the la next uh, last couple of years and purposely assigning uh, these dollars to a, a plan and, and assigning a budget to them. Um, you'll notice in fiscal year 22, looking at the graph, we didn't expend the full 10, 10 million that we have planned for the Higley High School building addition, but I represented the encumbrance in orange there. Uh, which showcases that we are actively addressing our capital needs with the capital funding that we currently have available. Um, but you can see that that is not a, a long-term solution to um, all our capital needs. Um, so over the course of the next couple of years, that capital budget balance will be decreased um, pretty fast uh, with ideally, hopefully we don't have projects to this nature that we have to fund from our district uh, capital budget. So I wanted to take a moment to just provide three key takeaways that, uh, from our budget funds for fiscal year 22 and looking forward. Um, number one, I addressed this earlier, but Higley's in good financial health. And I say that currently, uh, as, as we have the, the 
impending AEL um, decision um, that's going to be that would be detrimental to our fiscal health uh, if that does not pass. While we did budget for it, um, that would pretty much wipe out our our completely um, exhaust our budget balance. Um, so again, that while I say we're in good health, that is uh, contingent on that AEL being exempted and are permanently fixed. Um, number two, going into fiscal 23, we have adopted a new strategic plan. And so with that plan, we'll begin aligning financial resources um, to align with that strategic plan. Just this goes hand in hand with um, uh, the strategic plan itself um, and aligning budget to those initiatives. Lastly, um, you know, we've worked hard to rebuild trust and transparency with our with one fiscally um, and with everything we do. So um, we've made a conscious effort to incorporate inclusive decision making in, in some of our larger uh, fiscal decisions as well as our strategic plan, which those are perfect examples of incorporating inclusive decision making um, in large impactful decisions which goes a long way in activating uh, diversity, which improves innovation, engagement, and the overall results of the decision. So, Transitioning to our cash fund summary, um, again, cash controlled funds are generated by various revenue sources. Um, many of these funds have limitations on what they can be used for. They're not exactly a free fund, so to speak. Um, Many of these have limitations based on the Auditor General's requirements. There's two main differences between our cash funds. Um, the district funds, which are represented here in the graph, um, include food service, civic center, aka rentals, community schools, and indirect costs. But our sites also have cash controlled funds, which include auxiliary operations, extracurricular activities, and student activities. And those are managed and controlled at the sites. The district does not have any influence in how they spend those, um, rather we just account for them. Um, so diving into the district cash control fund summary, um, the first uh, graph there, or item there you see is indirect costs. Uh, this accounts for monies transferred from federal funds related to the cost of maintaining and operating our grants. Uh, the district transfers these funds based on an approved percentage calculation from the Arizona Department of Education. So. Uh, that ending fund balance, that's ending cash balance, excuse me, is relatively flat from the last fiscal year. Um, moving down, community schools, this category represents the monies received and expended related to our before and after school programs, as well as our camps and our preschool operations. So they're both encompassed in that fund. Our expenditures uh, related to these programs are funded from, the, uh, from this fund, excuse me, um, looking at the ending cash balance, it's still recovering from the, the indirect implications from COVID. Um, we've worked hard with Ms. Patty Gleason and Kim O'Hearn um, to set aside plans to rebuild this fund balance. A general rule of thumb is to have at least you know, one year's worth of expenditures. So if there was a case in which we had no revenue, uh, we could still support those teachers and or families that are, that are being funded from this um, particular fund. So one reason why we are looking at evaluating our pricing structure, and I think we'll bring that back um, later this November to the governing board to discuss. So. Moving down the list, Civic Center, this uh, represents our rental revenues and expenditures. So our, in, our ending cash balance has increased slightly over last year. Um, again, part of, it, part of it's COVID. People are coming back and using our facilities. Um, and so we anticipate that to continue to grow as we have capacity, so. And then lastly, our food service fund. Um, it's for food service, it's pretty self-explanatory there. Um, the large increase in the ending cash balance is because the district did not charge any indirect costs to this federal fund. So um, the 3.1 million represents approximately 3.1, or three months of revenue, uh, and it provides a cash reserve and flexibility for the district as we research um, the cost benefit of contracting, continuing our contracted food service or potentially staffing those um, internally. So, and that is all I have. Is there any questions? Questions or concerns for Mr. Moore? Nope. All right, moving on, Mr. Moore. I think you're next as well. 
for our 7.3 override update, please. All right, good evening, President Kaylee, members of the board. We have another annual report that we bring to you. Um, this evening, uh, I will be presenting our bond and override report. So this report is required if you have, if, if any district has a voter approved override and or bond. Um, we happen to have both still. Um, I'll get into that a little more, but the district did pass a, a voter approved MNO override in 2019. And uh, we do have a voter approved bond that was passed in 2013 and repurposed in 2019. So I will present out the expenditures, the plans for next fiscal year um, on those two voter approved authorizations. So first, our MNO override. Um, thank you, Curtis, for providing these lovely pictures of our, our students. Um, but there's a, uh, five main bullet points in which that MNO override was approved and um, initiated for. First was the in increased teacher compensation. Second, maintain and improve our elementary specials, such as arts, PE, music, and district athletics. Three, provide staffing to main, maintain average teacher class sizes. And four, support gifted special education in all day kindergarten and provide educational resources for our classrooms. Um, diving into, this is a, a pie graph of uh, fiscal year 22 expenditures. Um, the, this is an estimated representation of how those expenditures occurred in fiscal 22. The total increase to the district operational budget was about just over $12 million, which um, I would say Higley's beyond grateful for that additional funding, which allows us to continue to support um, those programs and the specials. Um, the main part of that pie graph, I won't go to each one of those, but was to um, help support that teacher compensation increase that the governing board approved last March. Um, and so looking into the future, um, that estimated budget increase for fiscal 23 is about 3.3 million. As a reminder, this MNO override is a percentage increase off our RCL, our revenue control limit. Um, that, that percentage increase is 15%. So as our budget or our um, district continues to gain more students and grow, um, the override will increase um, as well. Diving into our voter approved and repurposed bond. Um, so initially, this. Our voter approved bond um, was approved in 2013, repurposed 2019. Um, legally, we have to report out on the, the, the most recent, which is the voter approved 2019, um, or the repurposed 2019 authorization. Um, it was not a new authorization, it was just repurposing existing bond funds that could not be spent in the categories that were originally assigned. So um, I can say with we are being cognizant of this in our 22 proposal and being um, flexible with um, how we're putting our bullet points. Um, while we have a plan, um, we are not limiting ourselves on the voter pamphlet. So, the 2019 categories were are included right there. I'm not going to go into each one of those, but um, I do want to cover how the full 2013 uh, voter approved bond um, was originally earmarked. So that original bond authorization was 70.5 million. Um, this is how it was originally earmarked in the pamphlet. Majority of the funds going to the 2016 uh, school build of, of bridges. Um, and then the district again repurposed it in 2019. The existing, the remaining um, author, monies from this bond authorization is approximately 3.1 million. And I'll cover how we have those budgeted for fiscal 23. Um, first, this is how the district budgeted those repurposed funds, or the remaining repurposed funds in fiscal 22 in that first category. Um, coming into fiscal 22, we had about $5.1 million in bond uh, money remaining. Um, you can see all those expenditures in 22 were for um, the Williamsfield Field House and finishing that project. Um, Josh did, Josh Crosby, a transportation, transportation director, did purchase his buses in 22. However, they were still being produced and um, we still have not received those yet. So um, the budget in fiscal 23 is for those same purchased buses back in 22. Um, supply chain, 
that's a, a perfect example of the current supply chain um, issues that we're having. The remaining budget for fiscal 23 um, incorporates the, the new Higley High School um, phase one built classroom edition and the technology upgrades are associated with that classroom edition as well. So again, we have 3.1 million remaining in the bond and we, that will probably be spent pending. Uh, we have good news tonight from the, uh, the town of Gilbert that we have our permit finally. Um, this will more than likely be spent by the first of the year as construction gets started. So again, just a reminder that we have, that, that this is where the remaining funds will be going towards that Higley High School uh, groundbreaking. And that will fully exhaust our bond funds. And so um, we'll be relying on our capital funds pending our 2022 bond proposal does not pass. And with that, I'll take any questions you may have. Any questions for Mr. Moore? Nope, thanks for the presentation and breaking all that down for us. And with that, we are going to move on to 8.1. I move that the governing board approves a 2000 additional CSF allocation prorated on FTE to the certified teacher salary base and other certified approved in the CSF pay plan. Total allocation amount is $1,575,000. Second. And you can see all the names that are on the um, attachment tonight. Any questions or concerns? We covered this last time with Mrs. Martins. Went over it all. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries 5-0. And I move 8.2 that the governing board approve the fiscal year 2021-2022 annual financial report and attachments as presented. Second. Any other questions? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries 5-0. Okay, moving on, future agenda items. We have a preschool update coming, a course guide update. Um, CT update is done, check there. Special education program coming in January, HUSD marketing plan, and always the strategic plan update. I don't know if you all noticed, but um, I have to go back for just a second. Uh, Mr. Curtis, would you pull up the annual financial report um, PowerPoint for me again, please. And page down just a couple. If you look really close um, to my school board, the strategic anchor for finance and operations, you'll start noticing these are going to be on our PowerPoints um, moving forward. Um, I noticed it when I went through through it the first time and I thought it was amazing because that um, shows me all the more that our strategic plan is being talked about and infiltrated in everything that we do. So thanks again, Mr. Moore, for um, putting it. This was the first one that I noticed. I'm sure there'll be more, but I did notice that. So forgot to tell you earlier. Anything else that the governing board would like to see in a future board meeting? Yes. Like, I brought it up last meeting. Um, just curious, the timeline when we're going to start seeing policies coming forward with the House bill that passed. President Kaler, Board Member Anderson, you'll probably start seeing those. Where our policy committee is resurrecting again after fall break, starting next week. It takes about. We have several that are in the hopper, so probably the second meeting in November and into December. But we have several that we are working through, and one of the things we're working on is bringing. Um, our policy committee down to the individuals who are impacted by that policy to give feedback. So sometimes that takes a little bit longer to bring it to you, but it's more comprehensive when we do it that way, um, being that we've had input from the implementation of that. And it can align any um, of the exhibits or regulations that we're trying to put behind it so when we roll it out, it, it's implemented. So they are in process and coming, but they are there's a lot of background work we're working on them. Yeah, I can't imagine, um, plus the rumor mill and all the assumptions that are coming already, so I'm, I'm excited to get, and I know it's not going to be easy to get that on paper, but I'm excited to get some solid information down so, so people can stop guessing and assuming the worst. Thank you. 
All righty. Uh, we are going to move into our governing board self-evaluation um, time at this moment. So we're gonna go into a work study time, which will not be um, uh, tele or live streamed. However, um, we will also adjourn in there. So for now, good night and welcome back to Higley from Fall Break. <laughs>